Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are extremely happy and grateful to have you here with us for another webinar. I'm Elena Crescia, content curator of the Wellbeing Summit for Social Change. We'll have a conversation with the webinar series hosts, our inspiring friends, Sharon Salzberg and Parker Palmer, who you already know. And we'll have two very special guests with us today, Christiana Figueres and her daughter, Naima von Ritter. Christiana Figueres is an internationally recognized leader on global climate change. She was executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. She directed conferences in Cancun, Durban, Doha, Verso, and Lima, and then the historical Paris Agreement of 2015. She's the co-founder of Global Optimism and the co-author of the recently published book, The Future We Choose, Surviving the Climate Crisis. I'm not going to mention all the awards she received because we'll be here all day. One very special success that she has and that is not written by everyone is her daughter Naima von Ritter. She's a transformational coach and mentor. She's a co-founder of Conscious Living, born in Guatemala, raised in the US, and she recently published a book, The Community Facilitation Handbook. It is such an honor for us to have you with us. And with you together on that couch, I almost feel like we are in your living room. I think maybe you can, you also want to introduce yourselves as a mother-daughter duo. I leave it with you. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Elena. And we're really excited to be here because this is the first time that we are doing this duo talk and uh, really a pleasure to, to be doing this with you all. So thank you so much. And I'll let my mom introduce herself first. So I would like to introduce myself as being uh, the current presence of a Danish lineage on one side, a Spanish lineage on the other side, and me having been born in Costa Rica, in the wild and wonderful country of Costa Rica, from where we're speaking, and feeling very rooted here in this uh, wonderful country and in this culture. I also have to say that I am very proudly born in a previous geological era, in the Holocene, which is the era that we had before 1950s. And so that makes um, some of us on this call Holocenians and some of us born in the Anthropocene, <laughs> including myself. So yeah, again, my name is Naima and I come from a lineage of Costa Rican with all of the lineage that came before that, ancestors and German ancestors. And I, well, I was born in Guatemala, I grew up in the United States, and I'm now quite a nomad um, living between Costa Rica, Europe, and Argentina, where my partner is from. And yes, I am a baby of the Anthropocene, and we will share a bit more about that towards the end of, of our sharing. Um, but yeah, that's our... Yeah, the reason why we want to introduce the Anthropocene and the Holocene is because we will come back to that at the end. It's probably the biggest question that we all share right now. What do we want to do about that? Yes, indeed. And well, my mom and I have been working in parallel on climate change and co-living for some time now. Well, obviously my mom a lot more <laughs> on her topic than me on mine. Um, and now we're exploring this nexus between these topics, um, especially in the context of healing our inherited wounds and unhealthy patterns and trauma that, that we've inherited in order to really become the ancestors that we want to be for ourselves and for the future. So that's a little context of, of where we're coming from. Thank you so much, Christiana and Naima. And it's a it's just an honor to be with you in your living room with this wonderful mother-daughter 
dynamic and conversation. Um, I'll just tag on a note that I hope you can say something about the Jurassic age, which is when I was <laughs> born. <laughs> but with that as context, Sharon, it's always good to be with you. Another privilege once again. And I'm um, going to invite you to start us out uh, after this beautiful introduction with a meditation. Well, thank you. It is always a delight to be with you. And and I have the same feeling like we're in your living room, which is just, uh, it's so great. And I've been busy figuring out like, whoa, I just made the cutoff. You know, I'm like, I'm an elder of the new, newer age rather than uh, being a part of the other. So um, that was fascinating. Okay, so I really love beginning just with the possibility of gathering more fully each of us whatever hour it is for us, you know, has, has come together from somewhere where we've expended energy and we've gotten invested and, and here we are coming together. So to more fully facilitate that, um, let's do that a little bit consciously, okay? So if you wanna to sit together, uh, just sit comfortably, you can close your eyes or not. And let's just more fully recognize where we are you can notice what you're seeing even if your eyes are closed there may be little patterns of light or, or little changes and shading going on and notice what you're hearing whether it's my voice or other sounds Of course, we like certain sounds and we don't like others. But unless you are responsible for responding to the sound, you can just let it wash through you. Notice what you're feeling in your body, in your posture. We want some energy in our body, but not like so much. We're really stiff and uptight. We also want to be just relaxed and at ease as though being were the most natural thing in the world. So you can find your way of feeling balanced. And bring your attention to the feeling of your breath. Just the normal, natural breath, wherever it's clearest for you or strongest for you. And the operative word is rest. We're going to rest our attention on the feeling of the breath. Lightly, like a butterfly resting on a flower. Just one breath without concern for what's already gone by, without leaning forward for even the very next breath, just to be. And if you find your attention wandering, you get lost in thoughts, swept up in a fantasy, or you fall asleep, truly don't worry about it. This is our chance to practice letting go and practice beginning again. In effect, to practice resilience. Wherever your attention goes, it's fine. Nothing's been ruined, you haven't failed. We let go and we start over.
And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the formal meditation. And here we are. Thank you, Sharon. So I'm reminded once again that wherever I go, here I are. Uh, and here we are. <laughs> well, there's such a wonderful energetic between the two of you, uh, Christiana and, and Naima, that, that I realized that Sharon and I could ask almost any question and you'd go where it's important to go. Um, <laughs> uh oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's wonderful. So, but I want to start with a question of, involving a few words that really came strongly to me as I read your work and about your work, which has been so significant. The, the key word that came to me is healing. I think you're both very much about healing. And I think you're also about healing in a, in a broadband way. Uh, which is not always true when people talk about healing. So you're interested, you're committed to, you've worked hard at healing on the individual level, the social uh, or community level, and the global level. Maybe you've even, each of you specialized in a certain part of that spectrum more than some others. But just to, to open that very wide door into whatever kind of conversation you'd like to lead us in. Did I frame something that rings bells and that seems, uh, that defines uh, an energetic space that really has claimed your lives? Yes, no, very well. You really put, put, put your finger on it. Thanks for that, um, Parker. Um, and so, so we've been working lately on, um, being able to consciously elicit the insights that we have been using in our work, but to do so much more consciously, because I think we've both been working somewhat unconsciously with pretty powerful tools. And lately we've been saying like, wait, 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 let's see, what are these tools? What is really going on here? So today we wanted to share with you where we are on that thinking, and that is, how um, women, both of us being women, uh, play archetypal roles of both mother and daughter. And this is not to exclude men, it's not to exclude non-binary people, it's that there are, certainly we women have those archetypal roles and to a large extent, everyone has them. So we're just going to, without excluding anyone, we're just going to tweak that out and bring it out to, to sort of put it in the middle of the living room and, um, and look at it. Um, because our sense is, and, and this is definitely still a work in progress, but our sense is that all of us who are women are daughters by definition, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And some have chosen to be mothers um, and some have not, but even those who haven't, we're actually both mother and daughter playing those roles simultaneously. And what is really intriguing to us is that we play those roles simultaneously, mostly unconsciously. And the work that we're doing now, the, the inquiry that we're doing together is how do we make those roles how do we bring them out of the unconscious into the conscious use of them so that we can have the best impact? Um, and we see that that impact is played out at three different levels, as you've just mentioned, Parker. The individual, the, um, the community or social, and the global. So to just give you a little introduction, um, at the individual level, I think all of us will immediately recognize that who we are as mother or think who we are as a parent um, ha is one of the deepest impacts that we can have on our children if we have children or on our nephews and nieces, whoever the next generation is. One of the deepest impacts that we all live for years afterward is what kind of parenting did we have, especially what kind of 
mothering we had. And I think it is difficult to find a woman today who has not lived and continued to live in a trauma cycle that goes way up the lineage roll, right? Way, way up. So that is ancestral trauma that has been inherited from one generation to the next to the next. And if it is not healed, it is inflicted upon the next. So let me just give you my example. Um, I uh, was uh, was born into uh, into this wonderful Costa Rican family that has many different virtues, and at the same time, I have a mother who was psychologically incredibly abusive. So she told me constantly, "You're ugly. You're stupid. You are fat. You're never going to succeed. Uh, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you." That was like the narrative that I grew up with. So as we turn to be adults, we have a choice there um, about whether we take those stories that our mother gives us and declare them to be our reality. And in that case, we basically succumb to those traumatic stories, those narratives, those actions, because they're always followed with actions. Do we succumb and internalize that negative um, message, which means that we will be victims forever? Um, and then the worst part is not only are we victims forever, but we then turn around and become perpetrators onto the next generation. And so that's the choice there at an individual level. The choice is, do I accept that or do I use the pain and the grief and the, from the trauma, do I transform it into a very rich learning ground that allows me to become a nurturing, caring mother to my children, but to others as well, um, that then enables them to be joyous and nurtures their capacity to love. That is at the individual level. Then you take it one step further to the community level, basically the same thing. That is not where we are mothers as individuals, but where our mothering as an aspect of who we are comes into, into question. And that's where we have to choose. Do we actually walk into the communities, into our nuclear family? Do we, you know, do we extend our little mother wings only around our nuclear family? And those wings can be positive or negative, and they probably are both at the same time. Or do we actually expand our wings and say, my community is not just my nuclear family, it is much larger um, than that. And I extend my mothering wings around uh, a much larger community, which then of course takes us to the planet. I mean, for me, I go to the planet pretty quickly because that's my, uh, my home turf. Um, and it is not by coincidence that we have these many feminine terms for the planet, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, Pachamama, right? Because we think of the planet in those mothering terms, probably because all the air that we breathe comes from her, all the water we drink comes from her, all the food that we eat comes from her. So she is there as giving us the survival elements that we need. And very interestingly, our capacity as individuals, our capacity to identify with the mothering and supportive and survival context that the planet gives us, our capacity to identify with that is directly related to the depth of our own motherness, our own mothering. The clear my mothering is for me toward my daughters, toward the community, toward the planet, then the easier it is for me to embrace, embrace mother nature and mother earth and do the healing, the restoration, the regeneration that we know in the beginning of this century that needs to be done. So it is a beautifully connected uh, cycle from the individual to the community, to the planet. And of course, at our best, at our best, and we're not always at our best, but at, as our best, mothers can and should awaken um, those capacities in us and nurture our context at all levels, self, descendants, community, planet, and understand the interlinkages among all of that, what my teacher calls the interbeing, because we inter are. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and I'd love to hear I'd love to hear your <laughs> love to hear your commentary name on that, on all of that as the daughter in this case. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, thanks for that, Mom. So yeah, taking the perspective from the the archetypal role of, of the daughter um, at the individual level, the need to heal. Um, as daughter comes from, yeah, what often ends up being an inherited trauma, inherited unhealthy patterns of, of behavior that we get from generations above us uh, who've come before us. And so personally, in my case, um, I'm very grateful that my mom did a lot of work, inner work healing with Gestalt and other things to heal that trauma that she inherited from her mother. So I never heard from my mom, I hate you, you're fat, you're ugly, and you're stupid, right? So- Well, because you're not. <laughs> <laughs> but you could have passed that on if you had not yeah. done that work. And yeah. you, you very consciously did that work in order to heal that and to right. break that chain. And to break the chain, right. I remember my mom would talk about that a lot growing up that she broke the chain in that way. Um, and where I feel that there is more work to be done, and we've talked about this, <laughs> um, is an inherited pattern of constant busyness and doing and achieving. And I at least feel um, that this is linked to a sense of unworthiness or unworthiness, or I'm not worthy if I'm not achieving something or doing something or being productive, which I think doesn't actually come just from my mother, but is actually a societal kind of norm or expectation that, that we've all inherited, right? Which links them to the other levels. Um, but it is something we've talked about that we both and my sister as well find it difficult often to rest, to take care of ourselves, to find peace, to you know be in that being, that natural state of being we share in us, we so lovely share in the meditation. Um, and, and so if this this kind of you know pattern isn't healed, then then it you know, it will continue to get passed on and, and not allowing for that space for being, which is where we believe and see is the, tr the space for transformation, right? If, if, if we can find that stillness and that care for ourselves and listening to our inner voice and giving ourselves that mothering energy to observe the patterns that are keeping us unwell, then, then, then we're not allowing that healing transformation to happen. Mm -hmm. So so that's from the individual level. Um, then taking it to the community level from a, a daughter perspective, um, the, the trauma that I feel needs to be healed here is what we've inherited from hyper-individualization, patriarchal norms, modern society that pushes competition and separation on us, right? Um, and I think many, speaking for myself as a woman, have been taught to see other women as competition and, and men as a threat, right? In, in many cases, as, as opposed to our soul brothers and sisters who we can really trust and, and you know, feel that we can be cared and care for each other. And, and so I, this healing feels very important, first for my, my our own well-being because there's many studies show that our, our personal well-being is very directly linked to the social connections that we have and the intimate kind of trust that we have with others. Um, and also for being able to come together and collaborate and co-create solutions that we need to tackle the world's biggest crises and challenges that we're facing. If we're constantly in the separation and trust and fighting and competition, how the heck are we going to come together, build the trust, and collaborate? So for both of those reasons, all of those reasons, there's a need to heal this, this separation that is at the kind of community social level. And it's why for me, I one of the reasons why I'm so deeply invested and in putting so much of my life energy into community and helping to create conscious communities, um, you know, through my startup Conscious Co-Living and in other ways, um, because I think through conscious communities, which are those that, in my view, are, are supporting members to, to have space to heal, both at the individual and collective level, 
um, and to kind of develop and grow into our full potential as humans um, are so essential for us to be to be building in the world. And um, you know, because most of us never learn in school or work how to communicate effectively, how to not take things personally, how to deal with conflict, how to develop our emotional intelligence. That's that's not, there isn't a 101 on that in our schools, right? That's something ideally you learn. And, you know, I think through spiritual practice, we do get some of that, but that has to be an intention. And so what happens is we're often running away from difficult relationships. It, we run away with social media, through work, um, through addictions, and, and through community, we can heal there's a space for healing that. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Gabor Mate. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. Expert on, on trauma and mind body health. And he has a quote that says, we are hurt in early relationships, which means we also heal in relationships. And so relationships can be the ground for healing when approached properly. And I believe that conscious community can be that space and ground for that kind of healing in relationship. Mm -hmm. And I can talk more later um, specific examples of what that can look like. Um, but yeah, so that's about relearning how to be soul brothers and sisters at the community social level. And then finally, um, at the level of planetary love, uh, planet, um, the, the, the role of daughter and, and our healing in this aspect comes from healing our disconnection from our mother, our mother earth, right? And which is linked to, to our own mothers, um, because as my mom was saying, you know, we are alive because of the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, and we're so often disconnected from that. I mean, we just think of how most people live in the biggest cities in the world. There's so little connection to nature, and there's many studies that now show that people find it very difficult to care for the environment if they're separated from nature, right? And so um, that's one of the, for me, key way forwards for this healing process is finding creative ways to feel more connected to nature and to remember that it's basically suicide if we're not caring for mother earth because we depend on her. And in this way, also helping bring the cycle back to remembering to care for those who came before us and who have given life and sustenance and nourishment, whether through their breast milk or their love for us, you know, for us to be alive here today. So um, I'll leave it at that. That's uh, from the daughter perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's bringing up listening uh, to this beautiful description is bringing up a lot for me about a few things. One is awareness, of course, you know, to recognize. Mm that uh, there's a story we tell ourselves about ourselves, about who we are. There's a yeah. story others have told about us, whether you know personal, familial, or kind of community collective. There's a story others tell about us and that we maybe take to heart and absorb and manifest. Uh, and simply the fact that that exists, I think, uh, is not necessarily a shared understanding. You know, it takes a, a degree of awareness to notice that. I can remember um, teaching with Bell Hooks in Kentucky in, in the U.S. We were talking about that, about the kind of story others tell about us that we may absorb and and sort of define ourselves by. And someone in the in the group in the room said, "I don't understand." Uh, People, others don't tell a story about us. They don't know who we are. How could they tell a story about us? And I said in response, everything tells a story about us. Architectures tells a story about us. Like if we're living in a wheelchair, where do we enter the building? Is it in the front? Is it behind, way down a path? It's coming a back door. Uh, here I'm in New England, you know, in some icy uh, path. Uh, to get in the back door, you know, there's a story being told about us. And we tell stories about others as we create an environment. So, so we're constantly in this position of, do I take that to heart or do I let that go? And so I was really fascinated by that, thinking about um, 
our own awareness, collective awareness, and how we can pay attention to that. And the other thing that was very poignant that came to my mind was our our yearning to belong. Mm. And I thought of how many people have told me uh, there was a fractured relationship in my family. You know, I had a traumatic childhood or I had a a really uh, bad situation at home, but I found solace, I found peace. I found myself in nature because that restored that sense of, of nurturing, of belonging, of being a part of things. And so um, it was a very rich listening to you. Yeah. I've gotten that far. <laughs> you know? Okay, that, that's so nice. And, and what that brings up for me, Sharon, is that um, especially now over the last two years with COVID, I think that experience of going to nature in order uh, to, to, to have comfort and to recharge our batteries is something that has been experienced by many, many people who uh, you know, got very quickly fed up with being inside uh, four walls and needed nature. And so here's my question. Since we have discovered that nature is what charges, recharges our batteries and, and gives us the energy and, and, and honestly the love that we are seeking, how on earth then can we not devote our energy, at least part of it, to restoring and healing nature as opposed to destroying nature, which is what we're doing? Um, and, and maybe this is, you know, the moment to speak about the famous Holocene and, and Anthropocene. Um, Parker, I'm, I'm so delighted that you and I are both children of the Holocene. Um, that was the geological era that ended in the 50s, uh, during which we actually had a sweet spot. So we had 12,000 years in the history of this planet in which we humans went from being tiny little tribes and nomads to the civilization, if you want to call it, civilization uh, that we are today because we had absolutely perfect environmental conditions to do so. And then in the 50s, we actually took the pen of history in our hands. We were no longer the recipients of the, and, and the benefactors or the, or the beneficiaries, sorry, the recipients and the beneficiaries of a perfectly balanced environment, but actually we moved into what geologists now call the Anthropocene, which is the domination of humankind over natural uh, evolution. And now we are writing the history of the planet. Not for good, anything that you read, you know, go to Miss Google and just type in Anthropocene. Everything that you read about the Anthropocene is about destruction, pollution, congestion, you know, all negative. Now, the question then for us is, is that really the reality that we want to perpetuate? Very similar to, you know, do we want to perpetuate the reality, the pathological reality that many of us lived as children? Or do we want to step into healing, restoring, and regenerating on a personal level? Do we not want to do that also at the planetary level? Do we not want to and need to step into a different role of humankind that is actually one of healing, restoring, and regenerating mother nature? Because we already know that we really need her. So that, you know, that, that journey from being the victims of the trauma and being in that suffering and then saying, right, I know that that is a reality, but it's not the only one. We can actually consciously raise our awareness and move into a very different role. And that's what the Anthropocene should be about. We have 70 years of the Anthropocene, negative story. We have it, we have everything that it takes to now write a positive story of the Anthropocene. Yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe just to add on to that, Mom, is, um, you know, the, the sad truth that a lot of, people are choosing not to have children these days, right? And you, you ask them, <clears throat> a lot of my friends um, included, and it's, um, yeah, this, this fear of bringing another human being onto this planet because of where it's going and because of the potential that this other human could do to further destroy the planet, you know, all of this multitude of reasons. And 
you know, it, it, it pains me so much. Um, and, it, and it's linked, I think, to, yeah, what, what you're saying in a way that kind of the narrative of the impact that humans are having on the planet right now is negative, right? It's almost automatically assumed that if you're a human on the planet, you have a ne the impact that you have is negative. Lower your environmental impact, lower your carbon footprint, right? And I think the change and part of the healing that needs to happen is to empower ourselves to become creators of a regenerative world, of a regenerative Anthropocene, of the regeneration generation, which is what I feel that I am a part of as part of the Anthropocene. And, and I think there's still a lot of healing work to do because there's so much guilt, there's so much shame and fear, which are the lowest density, lowest frequency emotions that we have, right? So that really pulls us down and it doesn't allow us to be in this expansive energy where we, we can be manifesting and creating in the way that we would like to be ideally collectively as humanity. So that transformation is from the kind of that mindset perspective. Mm -hmm. My teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, now ours thinking, too. Ours we too. not only have the, the makings of, of the positive story, we have the people. Yes. Many wonderful people. Any of us, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This this takes me, friends, to a place that you brought me and, and us, Naima, in, in your comments earlier. I, I What came to mind when you were talking about um, the compulsion to act, mm. the, the, the drivenness that we find among many activists, not only in the field of climate change, but in every field that I know anything about. What came to mind was a phrase from one of my spiritual guides, Thomas Merton, who, who wrote about the violence of overactivity, the violence of overactivity. Oh, wow. it's, a, it's a very powerful quote, which I might be able to find after a little while, if it seems appropriate to just read it to you. Um, and it, it strikes me that what, what we have done in the Anthropocene to um, our planet, our precious planet, is a, a powerful example of the violence of overactivity. Absolutely. And, and, and for me, Naima, your comments raised a question about if I, as a climate activist or in any other field of activism, if I start to engage in that same overactivity, in, as a, in, a, in compensatory action, what I see as compensatory action, am I not at some generic level feeding the problem rather than alleviating it? Mm. In our, what's happening on our planet, uh, the photograph in my mind is, this is the result of a lot of human beings for a very long period of time, just trying to make a mark on the cosmos. You know, I want to prove that I was here. I want to build something. I want to make that river flow backwards. I want to put a dam where a dam never should be, yeah. right? I want to send emissions into the air. Who cares about, you know, the balance of chemistry on, on earth? It just proves that I'm building stuff down here and I'm making money off it and, and I'm making my mark. So activists don't make money off of what they do, but they make their mark, right? We always want to make something. The feminine mode suggests to me, among other things, receptivity, a certain kind of patience that, that doesn't negate the fierce urgency of now, mm. but that somehow dances with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just love to know starting maybe with you, Naima, because you brought this to my attention, and then with Christina as well, what, what the stuff I've been trying to describe inadequately here suggests to you or, or evokes in you. Yeah, no, that, that resonates a lot. I've never heard that term, the, the violence of overactivity, but um, definitely resonates. And, um, there's a, 
I just recently read an article that my mom shared of a, of a young woman activist, um, UK and um, I forget, Caribbean. And she was sharing how her overactivity and her activism was leading her into depression, leading her into not enjoying her life and asking this question, how can we create a more healthy form of activism? And that actually a lot of this unhealthy overactivity activism comes from hyper individualization. So almost feeling like I need to keep doing and, you know, that I can't find this time for rest and support often comes from the fact that we are not in community and we are not with other people who are supporting us, who are telling us, hey, calm down, hey, go take a rest, I'll take over for the day or for the week you take, right? And so how do we create more of these healthy, supportive networks of, of activists so that we can continue to do the important work that we're doing, but that we do it in a more healthy way where we have rest, but also more joyful and fun way. You know, things are more fun when we're doing them with other people. And, and yes, there are a lot of activists around the world who are collaborating on climate change, on all of the other issues that, that we need to be addressing. Yet I often see for myself and many others that it, it is almost like I'm at my computer and I'm just constantly going and I'm going and I'm going and I'm not sleeping and right so so how do yeah my question is how do we create more of that healthy environment and my own answer to the question would be through again conscious communities which have a higher purpose and where we can be together addressing and moving towards that but in a healthy and supportive environment yes yes thank you <clears throat> <clears throat> Christiana, how does that resonate with you? Well, um, I, I when you know, before we started um, recording, the, the two of you, um, Parker and Sharon, had asked us, you know, what, what have you learned from each other? And I think this is the moment to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I, as Naima has pointed out, I, my, my default energy is to do, 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 do because my angst about um, the climate and about, as you call it, the fierce urgency of us not getting to our timelines on time uh, just puts panic into me, absolute panic. And so, you know, I'm like, go, 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 go. And what I've been learning from Naima, who comes at this from a very different, I, I, I go at this whole space that we're trying to co-create here from the planet down, so to speak, to the individual. And Naima, I sense, goes in the opposite direction from the individual up to the planet and where we are meeting and, and, and still on this journey of inquiry is, so, so what is the fruitful, I would almost call it, since we're talking about female energies, feminine energies, what is the pregnant space of contemplation where we can truly see each other, where we can truly listen to each other and where we can co-create. Because my angst is that the climate community has now turned into what I have called publicly and therefore will do so again, a circular firing squad mm -hmm. where you know we are shooting at each other because we don't, we all agree that we have to heal the planet, but it's on the how that we don't agree. And so there are those who say, you know, we have to do it this way. No, that's wrong. We have to do it that way. No, that's wrong. We have to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And instead of listening to each other and understanding that actually all of these aspects are critical, important, and urgent, and we have to figure out how to bring them together, much like we bring together a puzzle. Um, instead of that, we're going with this in the hyper individualized approach that says, no, I am the owner of the total truth. I know exactly what needs to be done and nothing else is valid. Um, and therefore, you know, I pick up my musket and I enter this firing squad. Um, and it is so unhelpful. It is so unhelpful and uh, because it paralyzes us precisely in a moment of fierce urgency. And I love that term, Parker, thank you for that. Precisely in, in the moment of fierce urgency, that's when we should be slowing down 
and listening, deeply listening to each other to go like, huh, well, that aspect of what she's saying or he's saying is actually quite helpful to my approach. And furthermore, this is complex enough and urgent enough that everybody needs to be on board. This is a total all hands on deck. So we can't even afford to exclude each other. But we do so in, in this, you know, frenzy busyness, do, 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 we exclude each other. And it's when we move from the doing to the being that we then make space for each other. Yes, yes, thank you both. And, and I, I, I just need to say personally how much I resonate with what you're saying, both of you, about the role of community in helping bring us to this point of collaboration, of settling in, of focusing, of making safe space for each other. I know that, Naima, that's been a big theme in your work, safe space, trusting space, where we can say how it really is for us, rather than just give the, the, the rhetoric uh, the, of activism. Um, just autobiographically, I spent 11 years living in a Quaker community called Pendle Hill. You're probably aware of Monteverde and Costa Rica. And it was within that Quaker both community. both went to Quaker school, so yeah. we're very... <laughs> okay, so you're, you're on the team. I went to Swarthmore College, I even went to friend school. <laughs> yeah, you're on the team. I can see the inner light, uh, inner light in both of you. Definitely. And, and, and it, was, it was really in that setting uh, that I, as a burned out community organizer, began to learn the value of some of what you're talking about here. Mm. I, I want to pass it back to Sharon because she's in community building too around these very themes. But if, if it's possible for me to screen share, just as a gift to the two of you, I'd love to show you this quote by Thomas Merton. It's pretty oh, wonderful. Please yeah. do. I looked for it, you know, when uh, you were speaking, I was Googling, but the thing that kept coming up, Parker, was your podcast about it. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, well, I can't play a podcast. Which we should all listen to anyway. <laughs> Well, let me see if I can share my screen here and uh, get this thing up. Can you see anything? Yes. Okay, it's called The Violence of Modern Life by Thomas Merton, Trappist monk of the mid 20th century. There is a pervasive form of modern violence to which the idealist most easily succumbs, activism and overwork. The rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form, wow. of its innate violence. To allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything wow. is to succumb to violence. Wow. The frenzy of the activist neutralizes his or her work it destroys the fruitfulness of his or her work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes work fruitful. Wow. And there's your word, Christiana, fruitful, uh, right, right on target. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. That really is a, a real gift. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. So first I was going to ask, may I be an honorary Quaker? <laughs> and then maybe everybody's an honorary Quaker. Maybe yeah. that's the point. <laughs> sure, and you already are. It, well, thank that, you. that was decided by the community a long time ago. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> then I had a feeling maybe everyone's an honorary Quaker. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the point. <laughs> that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> so I've been thinking also um, about balance. Like Naima, there was there was something um, beautiful that. I felt was almost like an assumption in what you were saying in the role of community that it was okay to have fun, that we need to be able to take in the joy that uh, we can be so burdened and so weighed down that we, we just can't work anymore. We can't be anymore in a, in a full way. And so uh, that was intriguing, you know, is uh, something that often I think needs to be made explicit, not just implicit. And then that also reminded me of, speaking of podcasts, the title of uh, your podcast, Outrage and Optimism, which uh, implies a kind of exquisite balance to me, like 
we can be so optimistic that we're just like in space, you know, it's like irrelevant in terms of what's actually happening. Or we can be so outraged and so defined by what's happening that we lose a sense of possibility. And so uh, both um, comments, you know, or, and the podcast, uh, you know, I, I was just thinking about that exquisite balance we're always needing to have so we can go forward. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, is, that is exactly why we, we entitled the podcast Outrage and Optimism, because we feel we need both energies. And some days we're sort of more in one direction and other days we're more in the other direction. I just went through two days in which I was way over on the outrage side. Um, and <laughs> she knows. Um, and, uh, and I'm sort of coming back to center. But over time as an average, it is important to have that balance um, so that A, we are not blinded to the challenges that we have in front of us we really need to understand that but also not limited by our understanding of those challenges so you know to remain hopeful or what rebecca solnit calls um act of hope right to remain engaged uh and know that we actually do have the wherewithal to address the challenges that we have right now that we're not going to give up that this is this this is what we're here on this planet for these few minutes that we're here that's why we're here now um and i actually happen to feel that it's a sacred moment it's a sacred moment in the history of uh, of human evolution the fact that we do have the the power of the pen right now and hence you know having the power of the pen to write the future not just for our children but for at least seven generations down the line that's a sacred responsibility. And so we can't shirk that responsibility. We have to stand up, pick up the pen and make sure that we are writing the right narrative for the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A mission for every writer mm -hmm. and every human being. And every Naima, human being. I'm really curious, have you always known that about taking in the joy that it was okay and... Um, yeah, actually, interesting. This has been something that I that has been very present for me in the last few years. Um, sometimes I get uh, criticized or kind of hushed, or it feels to me like pushed down when I'm enthusiastic or excited or happy or joyful or wanting to dance. And it's it's actually been quite uh, a challenge because I sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, am I being too enthusiastic happy. too happy <laughs> you know and it's and like I feel very blessed to have grown in a childhood where especially my father was very playful and and, and bringing that energy and um and also in nature and and I have noticed having to kind of really ask myself who am I who do I want to be and am I, am I going to allow other people's opinions to kind of hush me down I got a very clear image of this, um, the power of play and, 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 and of fun, very clear. And, and the message just kept coming, let's play, let's play, let's play. And I've actually written um, a blog post about the importance of having fun and play as adults, because we do tend to forget how to play and how to have fun. And yet there's so many benefits from you know, emotional release and, and, and having mental peace to creativity, to focus, to building relationships. Um, and and in the, I actually wanna write a book on play and fun at some point. So uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> you hit it right on, you hit it right on, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll help you with promo on that book for sure. There you go, there you go, great, thanks. <laughs> It's a book we all we all need. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm very interested in in the question of how therefore shall we live? You know that ancient classic question. And I I want to be kind of concrete and specific about this. I'm interested in the in two ends of that spectrum, which obviously. Um, needs to be mooshed together and has been mooshed together and everything. Well, I like the said. technical word moosh. Mooshed, yeah. I don't want to lose anybody in Kantian philosophy, but yeah, moosh. 
<laughs> That's great. So, um, <laughs> so the the two ends I have in mind are are at one end the the safe space for real vulnerability that you've written and spoken about, Naima, and at the other end the political space that you've been so effective in, uh, Christiana. Remarkable achievements with the Climate Accord and a whole lot of other things. So what, what I'm interested in is, is, is a bit of, I know this is an impossible question, but a bit of the how to do it for the woman or man on the street, as it were, because everybody eventually gets to that question. How, how can I be working with, let's say, a concept of safe space and, a, and or a concept of political efficacy. Um, from my seat here in Madison, Wisconsin, as, as, a, as a citizen, a citizen with a voice, but just a guy, you know, who's trying to find his way in a complicated world. Let me just open that question up for both of you in terms of what does safe space mean to you, Naima? What does political engagement mean to you? And how do you find yourselves crafting that as you as you work with other people? Mm. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, so safe space to me is a place of non-judgment and where we can authentically express ourselves without fear, where we can take off our masks, all of the masks that we wear or are expected to wear and to just truly be ourselves and be vulnerable. Um, and I actually often facilitate what are called sharing circles, um, women's circles and also for communities for co-living where we are able to get into that, that safe space. And what allows that is a set of guidelines that we all agree to. So number one is confidentiality. Number two is we speak from our own personal opinion. We're not theorizing, we're not talking about other, we only speak from our personal experience. We're not coaching or, or trying to fix anybody. And we practice deep, active listening, which I think is one of the most important skills that all humans could be developing right now. How do we actually practice that deep listening, which I'm sure you'll talk about in terms of the political landscape. Um, and, and, I, and I really think it is about that if we're able to, to first feel safe to authentically express ourselves and know that there is a receptive ear and listening and a willingness to understand and, and, and hear and have an open mind and compassion that just in that there's healing, just in being able to share openly, just in, in he hearing other stories, there's healing. It's sitting in a circle is, is, is healing and in that safe space because we're so often anxious and afraid and in survival mode and what's gonna happen and the world, right? So even sitting in circles is actually one of the most ancient forms of humans to interact. Right, and, and you feel that safety. We can all see each other. We're equals. Um, so that's one of my big projects in in this lifetime is to bring circles everywhere into the world. Fractals, you know, of circles, um, starting through co living. But I also envision these kind of spaces, safe spaces, happening in schools. How how to get children to sit and begin to talk about their emotions and to not bully each other, but to actually listen and, and care for each other in workplaces instead of these serious meetings where everyone's sitting around a rectangular table and you can't even see the other person at the end. Why not shift the way that you sit? Why not create a different dynamic so that there's actually trust being built, so there's actually listening being built? Politics, how do we bring this into politics so that there's actually listening and where we're not trying to make the other politician look like the biggest idiot in the world, but where it's actually like, oh, you're representing a different view and idea. And we're all ideally trying to get to some higher good. So why don't I actually listen to you and try to incorporate what you're saying so that we can get there together? And that's my answer for now. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's a great answer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I've often thought these things on Capitol Hill that they call hearings, nobody hears anything. <laughs> no, not, not, a, not a word. So, Christiana, how about at the political end of the spectrum where Naima just took us? <laughs> yeah, um, 
So, so I think there's a fallacy of thinking that, uh, just to use your two terms, safe space and political space, there's a fallacy in thinking that safe space is the domain of the heart um, and politics is the domain of the mind or the brain. Um, and the fact is that both of them are about transformation. That's what they're really about. Um, and that's what they have in common. And so Naima has just, you know, described how uh, the circles that she facilitates and trains others to, to facilitate, what they're really about is not only, it certainly starts with where am I right now, but it also is an invitation to transform the current feelings toward wherever the group wants to go or the person wants to go. It's a transformational experience. Yeah. And I don't think anybody would doubt that politics also needs to be transformational because it hasn't yielded too much, um, too much uh, up until now. And so in, in my experience, that is more on, on that side, what I have found very eye-opening is that if I stay in my engagement with people who are, you know, making decisions in a corporate world or in, in the public space or wherever, if I stay in my engagement with them on a head-to-head -head level, there honestly is very little space for change, very little space for transformation because our heads have already decided, right, this is the box that I'm going to be in and I'm not going to even peek out of that box. And then I obsess about explaining to somebody else every single little nook and corner about that box. Um, mm -hmm. But I stay within the box. Whereas is, if I engage with these people who are making decisions on a heart to heart level, now that is an opening. That's an opening because what we all have in common, believe it or not, is we're all human beings. And the moment that we connect at that level, now we have a huge opening that throws light into that little mental box. And all of a sudden the contents of that box rearrange or the box opens up and something spills out or something comes in, you never know. But there is a huge possibility for transformation that would not have come from an engagement that is only head to head. So, you know, to say that safe spaces are the domain of the heart and politics is not the domain of the heart actually misses the point of how you can use the forces and the power of the heart to transform politics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I jump in there? Um, First, I want to laugh because sometimes you say, well, believe it or not, we're all human. And sometimes when my mom's anger gets very big, she'll like, well, some that's subhuman. She'll call them <laughs> subhuman. Somebody's completely, completely outrageous. That goes against all of humanity. Yeah, I put him outside my circle of compassion for a little while. That eventually I have to bring him back in. But right. You, well, you know, I, yeah. Every, every circle of. Yeah, every circle of compassion needs a waiting room. I do. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I thought you were going to talk about the door, like some kind of swinging door. You know? yeah. <laughs> a waiting room. That's yeah, that's nice. Um, but just to to add on to what you're saying about you know this assumption of the heart and and mind. One of the questions that we had been talking about before is what have I learned from from my mother both personally and professionally. And I think that is definitely one of the biggest learnings I've gotten or received is how to approach people and situations in a way that builds that heart to heart connection and being open to be emotional and being open about crying and about showing sadness and about showing you know, that, that level that we don't often see in politics where it is just talk, talk, talk about you know some of the most disastrous things happening in the world and and i seen many times the power that my mom as one little woman can have to completely transform an entire room mm -hmm. of you know oil and gas companies who are thinking oh we do need to change or politicians or bankers or whatever, to really create that shift because they're tapping into something very deep that often we have forgotten because we've been traumatized, because we didn't get the love we needed, because we've been 
whatever, right? So really tapping into that 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 deep humanness. Healing, restoring, regenerating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Come full but, circle. Amazing what happens when we're willing to be human with each other, right? And Indeed. Be, and that means being vulnerable and connecting at the heart. Well, I think it's an interesting dilemma because it's not just politics, it's almost any workplace. Yes, totally. Right? It, Absolutely. It's, you know, the thought of that as a safe space, as a place of revealing vulnerability, uh, it's unlikely, uh, but not impossible. And important to do. And important to do. Yeah. Well, now yeah. you have me all fixated on the waiting room to my circle of compassion. Like, <laughs> do I have food? I mean, they have to have something, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll <laughs> think. Just to your point on that, Sharon, I think that's where the importance of leadership comes in. And what do we define as leadership, right? Often we think of leadership as this big, strong person at the top who's saying what everyone should do. Whereas I think for us, leadership is being able to influence in a positive way. Um, and in this case, influence that we can be vulnerable, that we can connect from that. And I think if one person with influence who is in a position of leadership can bring that, then that can have a ripple effect. And I've seen that. I've seen how my mom transformed the UNFCCC through that kind of leadership, right? Yeah. And, I, and we're seeing a lot of leaders uh, who are doing this. So um, that's also like, how do we transform the idea of leadership for this purpose? I think when you lead from that place where we always point here, and say, I'm, I want to lead from here rather than from here. I, I, it seems to me what's, what happens is you're, you're building a stronger container for relationships, which necessarily need to hold an ongoing conversation about very complex matters. Yeah. You know, there, there, there are meaningful, I mean, there are some, there's some questions where there is no either this or that. I mean, one is right and one is wrong, right? Uh, like the battle between fascism and democracy. There's, there's, that's not a, an equivalency. But there are a lot of things which look different from different angles. We need to hear each other. We need to negotiate with each other. We need to talk respectfully with one another. We need to compromise to make, you know, to meet people uh, at, I don't want to say halfway, it's at different points on the, on the spectrum. And that just requires a strong container. And, yeah. and, and every time we blow up the container, that conversation is over, probably for a very long time to come. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Now I see Elena on our screen. Elena, are you telling us that it's time to sadly close this conversation? Actually, um... We, we are organizing the Wellbeing Summit and we are interweaving content with art throughout the whole program. Nice. So Sharon has a very special question for you too. Um, I was curious, you know, uh, one of the great delights of my being able to spend time with Parker is hearing who has influenced him when he'll bring in a poem or he'll bring in uh, you know, a quotation. So I was wondering if there was an artist or work of art or a poem that has inspired you and, and given you energy and moving your heart. Mm, beautiful question. Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so for me, this is actually one I share with my sister. <laughs> it's a, a quote by Marianne Williamson. <laughs> the one about, I'll read it. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? And um, I mean, it goes on, but I, I really love that. Yeah, encouragement of asking ourselves, are we really doing a service to ourselves and to others by staying small, which I think often we are taught to be, and especially women, I think also men, but is 
I think especially women to, you know, stay small, even in Spanish, there's a, a phrase that says, oh, if you're quiet, you're prettier, you know, stay quiet because you look prettier, you know, and that's very ingrained in, in a lot of cultures. And so really working through that and, and allowing our inner light to shine is, uh, is something that I'm constantly inspired by and, and try to bring to, to the world and others and myself first. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget yourself. Yeah. And for me, um, there is no doubt that the most inspirational and, um, and educational person in my life, in my, uh, in my own work um, has been Thich Nhat Hanh, who passed away just uh, in January, um, a Vietnamese Zen master who uh, founded the Plum Village Monastery in France and many others. And I was truly blessed to, uh, to discover his teachings at a time of horrible misery for myself. And then I was very blessed to meet him personally. And what I, I love so many things about Thai, which is what we call him, Thai means teacher in Vietnamese. Um, but one of the wonderful things that I love about Thai is his capacity to express a very profound concept in very few words. And, um, and, and, and he's also an, an artist uh, and a calligraphy master. And one of his, for me, one of my favorite calligraphies of his is his very short quote, no mud, no lotus, uh, which means that when, and, and we always are, we are in some kind of a challenge. It's either working through childhood traumas or it's the daily, uh, the, the daily challenge, well, very often linked between the two, although we know it or not. And we can either just stay in the mud or we can understand that that mud, because lotuses actually grow from the mud. And so we can understand that that mud is precisely the fertile ground for our learning and for our blossoming um, into being the kind of, uh, of mothers, daughters, leaders, humans, humans um, that um, ancestors. ancestors that we would love, uh, we would love to be. And so instead of um, being derogatory about the mud that is, uh, that we encounter on a daily basis and throughout our love uh, life, instead of being ungrateful and derogatory about that mud, if we can use it as the transformational space to um, to have beautiful lotuses um, bloom from there, then, then we have a very different quality of life and a very different experience. And we have a much better impact on our wonderful Mother Earth. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. And, you know, having been born at a time when the primordial ooze was still going on, I appreciate that affirmation of mud. You know, it's, it's good. It's very good. It all comes from the mud. Sharon, you have a wonderful way of bringing us in for um, a, not just a soft landing, but a meaningful landing with a meditation period of time for around all that we've been hearing and absorbing from these wonderful, wonderful guests and this wonderful opportunity to experience a mother-daughter relationship that, has, that is so generative in our world. Can I invite you to, to do that with us now, to lead a meditation, to begin to close us out? Sure, I, I would love that, uh, just as I've loved this conversation. So uh, once again, why don't we just sit comfortably? You can close your eyes or not. In the spirit of love, um, I'd like us to do some loving kindness practice where we just gently repeat the phrases that express the gift we would like to give to ourselves. Phrases like, may I be happy, may I be peaceful, may I be free. It's a sense of blessing, of offering. Instead of going through the list of our faults, one more time, <laughs> we just move our attention to this, it's like generosity of the spirit. So three or four phrases, you can just repeat them gently. 
See if you can bring your attention to each phrase just one at a time and repeat them with enough space and enough silence so that it's a rhythm that's pleasing to you. You don't have to try to force a special feeling. The power of the practice comes from that complete wholehearted gathering. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. May I be free. Or whatever your phrases might be. And then if you can call to mind someone who's been like a benefactor for you, someone who's helped you, maybe they've helped you directly. They've helped pick you up when you've fallen down. Or maybe you've never met them. They've inspired you from afar. Buddhist texts say, this is the one who, when you think of them, you smile. Who lifts you just as you think of them? Could be a puppy, could be an adult, could be a child. And if there's someone, bring them here. You can get an image of them or say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence. And offer phrases of loving kindness to them. Even if the words don't seem perfect, they're carrying the heart's energy, so they're serving us. May you be happy. Be peaceful. Be free. Okay, I'm just compelled to do it. Someone who's been in the waiting room. You don't have to let them all the way in, but let's just, maybe they can stand on the threshold, you know, and just see what happens as you include them. After all, you know, it's from our own pain that we act so recklessly, that we get so disconnected. And then all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, near and far, known and unknown, may all beings be happy, be peaceful, be free. So thank you. Thank you so much.
Yes, thanks to both of you. Thanks to you, Sharon. I emerged from this with uh, all kinds of fresh hope and fresh resolve. And uh, part of that is I resolved to have a very comfortable chair, some snacks, and a lot of sunlight in my waiting room. And I'm so glad. <laughs> Maybe skylights, you know, that's how the sun comes <laughs> in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely to see the two of you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. It was such a pleasure to have you. And when Sharon said that we could also say, think of other phrases, I was inspired by the two of you. And I also thought, may I be playful and may I be an optimist and hopeful. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Naima, I hope one day you will come and visit me in Brazil. I want to introduce you to Wellington Nogueira. Maybe you've not, you met him already, but he always says that instead of focusing so much about lifelong learning, we should think more about lifelong playing. Play. Ah. We have to keep playing forever. We have to keep our inner child alive. And um, Nice, you know, like, nice. I think you will have so much to to have like really beautiful conversations with. Um, thank you so, so much for the learnings and for the insights today. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much. And thank you truly for being open to, to having us as an, this was an experiment for us and we totally loved it. Yeah. I have to say that as a mother of two daughters myself, it was very inspiring to see your interaction today. The amount of respect and admiration that we can see in your eyes and how much you enjoy each other's presence. It was really beautiful to see. It was really a privilege to be part of this session. You should very take fun. it on the road. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. For another beautiful webinar, Parker, Parker and Sharon, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for all your work, indeed. Yes. And Bye. see you in the next webinar then. Uh, it was an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the tech team. I know there's a lot of work. Tech, I know. Tech thank you. Thank you so much, Alice, Isaac, and Tolani, I see. You are here helping us and we couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.